So my name is Thomas Rogers. I work for uh, DRW Trading. We do a lot of um, financial applications. We tend to interact a lot directly as market participants. And um, this is a technique that's kind of born out of some of our frustrations with um, writing wire protocol handlers. And it's a pretty code heavy presentation. So if I'm going too quick because I'm nervous, uh, let me know. I'll try to slow down. Um, so the first question with any of this is, you know, why not use protobufs, thrift, or whatever? Um, these are great when you control both ends of the communication, but there are many important use cases where this is not. Um, we tend to run into the third party systems case, uh, financial exchanges. We also, um, because of latency sensitive concerns, um, sometimes have the embedded device case as well that we're concerned with. But you could also potentially use this for legacy system uh, interface where using some off the shelf library and, lang and uh, code generator like Thrift or, Boost or Google's protobufs isn't going to work for you. Um, there is always the classic C pack structure and overlay way. This is you know, very simple and efficient. You declare a pack struct that looks like the bytes on the wire. You do a reinterpret cast to get um, that view off of a byte buffer. And except for dealing with host uh, network ordering issues, um, it's pretty straightforward. But you still have to go member by member in your struct and fix up all of the integral types which will be um, in network order to get them into host order if you're unlucky and on 99% of the machines in the world which are Intel, um, at least server-wise. Um, maybe 99 is a bit exaggeration, but a lot of machines are in Little Indian and network order is Big Indian. But many fundamental protocols are implemented this way, TCP, IP, they all use this technique and it's very efficient. Um, but you're left with pretty limited abstraction capabilities. Plain data types are all you get. Um, it forces whatever the third party's types are into your uh, type domain, so you can't use your types to represent the wire types. Um, we still have to do all the member-wise fix-ups for ending this, and this gets to be an error-prone maintenance issue over time. And in my experience, this approach really starts to fall apart once you have more than one variable length field in a data structure. Um, it's nice if you have one variable length data structure at the end of your, did I not turn away, sorry. Um, one variable length data structure at the end of a pack struct, that's easy, but if you have nested variable length data structures or recurring collections of them, it gets really messy to write that kind of code using um, a static cast over a pack struct um, or a reinterpret cast. And the resulting code doesn't really lend itself uh, to reuse at all, in my experience anyway. Um, reflection, if there was a way to do memberize, memberwise iteration um, and dispatch on types in C++, this, this would solve the problem and we wouldn't need to use the tech, or at least part of the technique that I'm going to present here. But there's nothing available in the standard today. There is an active study group uh, looking at this, which is SG7. It's chaired by Chandler Carruth. And so if you want reflection in C++, you should go hassle him about that. Um, and their initial focus is on compile time reflection. So you can ask information about types at compile time, which is very similar to what we're going to be doing here. Um, so in the introduction to Boost Fusion, um, the documentation, there's a big long paragraph. I won't read the whole thing. But the big parts are it lives in this twilight zone between compile time metaprogramming and runtime programming. And whereas STL works on containers of values and Boost MPL will work on containers of types, Fusion lets you work on both containers and types at the same time um, from runtime. And so I would submit that this actually can be viewed as a container of types and values. You can think of the type list as a boost MPL list of all the types that are in this struct. And you can think about the fields as being references to those types in a tuple. And in fact, if you had both of those forms, you could basically get zero on the MPL list and have the type, and get zero on the tuple and have a reference to that field within the struct. Although coding all that up by hand would get pretty tedious in a hurry. 
Um, so Boost Fusion allows you to use a little bit of macro magic um, by pulling in the defined struct header and re reorganizing your structure declaration using this defined struct macro um, to generate what is essentially those two pieces. You get an MPL list of the types in your struct and you get an ability to reference every single field um, that's in a struct. Um, we haven't, eh, skip that. But before I go too much further, I want to talk a little bit about ASIO buffers in particular. A lot of the code I write tends to rely on ASIO or ASIO or how you want to pronounce it. Um, two of the types exposed from this library that are going to be used in my code samples are uh, const buffer and mutable buffer. They're non-owning types. They don't own the underlying storage. They only contain a pointer to some data and a length. Uh, they support an, an addition operator, which allows me to return a new buffer given an offset from the start of my buffer. Allows me to cast to a given T star, return the buffer size, and copy one buffer to another. Um, so the first thing we want to do is visit each member in a struct in a member-wise fashion. Um, we're going to create a reader visitor. I know Strustrup hates visitors, but that's how you have to use it here. Um, and we'll go into the details of readers shortly. Um, we're going to construct it with a buffer. We're going to create the type that we want to actually read from the buffer, and then we call fusion for each with our type and our visitor, and then return our type, or an instance of our type. The reader, in our case, is going to look kind of like this. It's going to hold a const buffer, which we're going to consume. And then you implement a call operator. In this case, we're going to be generic T over some value type. And this will get called for each member of a fusion annotated struct in order. The problem is, is that visitors are expected to be taken by const ref by for each. So we have to, unfortunately, make our state of our reader mutable and declare our call operator const. This is just an annoying artifact of how for each is written. Um, and so the writer is going to look basically the same at this point. So if you want to write out a fusion structure, you're going to write it into a mutable buffer instead of consuming it from a const buffer. The first order of business is we need to fix up I can, if, if you want, I, yeah. Um, question, so your, your struct was specified using uh, fusion define struct? Yeah. Um, you, how do you pass attributes to it? Like, you, you pass attributes back? To oh, actually, at this point, I, I glossed completely over this. This is not a pack struct at this point. Okay. okay. And there, and in general, once it's on your machine, you don't want it to be packed, probably, for performance reasons, although on Intel, it's a pretty minimal penalty. Um, but on other machines, like, about, about, back struck versus not back struck. about performance of them, or there's no way to specify this as a pack struct that I'm aware of. Okay, it is it is standard layout okay. done this way. Um, so the whole point here is is that we're going to try to get away from needing to do the overlays with a pack struct. Right. Um, so it doesn't, doesn't uh, for each basically dispatch on type rather than on, uh, so how do you, how do you, so you have two new and sixteen. Right. Uh, how do you distinguish between the two and the computer operator? You get a reference to val, right? The first u at sixteen will be presented to you as the first time that this gets called as val, and the second one will be presented the second time that this gets called as val. You get passed by reference. Yeah, the for each iteration does that. It's it's literally going, if we go here, right, it can it's going first u int sixteen corresponds to that u int sixteen t in this tuple here, approximately, right? Second one, third one. But it it's this entire when you call for each, it will visit each one of these individually. There's no keeping track of which one's been called, because that's captured in the iteration outside that's part of the for each implementation. If I understand, I, maybe I'm not understanding the question. I think the question is, you know, how would you do something different to some level of iterating over, you 
We're going to get to that. <laughs> so we're going to get to that. Right now, this handles NET, and not particularly well. We're going to become more selective about this as the... So right now, each time that... Hold on here. Ah, hold on. Let's go back here. Each time that this gets called, it's going to present a different T, right? A reference to a different T. And it'll be called one for each element that's visited by for each. It'll be called once. And so that's the writer. Um, so the first thing that we typically will want to do um, is to fix up network ordering. The standard calls for this are n to h long, n to h short, h to net long, h to net short. You can use B swap for other structures that are not um, handled by those types. Um, there is a proposal to add a generic or somewhat generic n to h, h to n, but it's only for unsigned integral types. So if you happen to receive signed integral types over the wire, um, the proposal as it stands today is not going to help you, but it's pretty easy to write your own generic versions of these that do the right thing for the integral types that you're going to expect to get. Um, having done so, basically for each type, you know, for each T val, you can say, you know, net to host, and then you do the buffer cast to a T star, dereference that um, for a given buffer, and assign into your value, and then you assign buffer an offset of size t. So this, is, this consumes size of t bytes from buff and sets buff to point to the next point in the buffer that you're going to consume from on the next time that this gets called. So you are tracking on each call where to start reading from by doing this. The writer case, basically the same thing except we're signing into the buffer instead and advancing the buffer. So it's so often that you will have fields that represent enumerated values. Um, message type is kind of a prime candidate in this structure here. C++ 11 added scoped enumerations, which has this convenient ability to specify the actual underlying type that you want to use. So you don't get whatever the default type for enum is. You can be explicit about it, and then you can switch, you can switch out your uint32t and say, I want to read from this. This is going to be this enumerated type at this point. The problem is, is that this t only works on integral types because n2h only understands integral types. So we need to make this more selective. Um, and that's where... Is this auto arrow syntax familiar to everybody? Um, everybody pretty familiar? No, okay. <laughs> not you? Okay. So the idea is, is that with auto, this is not auto as a C14 return type deduction. It's basically a placeholder to say, I'm going to tell you the return type later. And the arrow is pointing to or essentially the type that's going to be yielded from this function. Next thing is, who all is familiar with enable if and how that works? Quite a few. So for those that aren't, I mean, enable if is essentially allowing us to say, if t is not part, is not an integral, that type attribute does not evaluate to a valid expression, this whole thing gets removed from the set of considered overloads. It won't be compiled, and that's OK in C++ because there's this sphene or substitution failure is not an error property with templates. Um, but if it is a valid overload, the return type will be void, just like it was before. This is just a way to push this goo for selecting the type down so it's not part of the, not, not as prominent in the uh, interface contract for this, this function. Um, you could have just as easily put the type name uh, enable if before the operator call, but then you're what you're actually calling and what it expects is kind of lost in the, the noise of, of the enable if. I'm told by Andrew Sutton that concepts will make this all magically better when we get it, um, but until then, we kind of are stuck with something like this. Um, 
Yeah, only half as ugly though. That's that's 50% improvement, right? Or <laughs> um, so at this point, this will now only select for integral constants. We won't accidentally be able to pass an enum to it, and then we can just add an overload that knows how to handle any type of enumeration using the same approach. And in that case, we will ask the enum for its underlying type. So this will get back the uint t or uint 32t for us as type v as the type of v. We can just delegate back into the reader at that point because we already know how to read that type. Um, and then we can static cast it back to the enumeration type and we're, we're done with enumerations. Um, so a lot of protocols will have fixed tag data. These are things like magic signature bytes and protocol version markers. In a lot of cases, don't really care about what those are. I want to encode a type and a value for it and that looks a lot like integral constant. Has anybody used who all uses integral constant for a few people? Um, so the appropriately named magic and version seem to be good candidates for this. So we can declare those as an integral constant u at 16t, the type or the value that we expect, and u at 16t value we expect for magic and version. Um, and then you add the corresponding overload to your reader. One thing to note here, integral constant doesn't store any data, so that member of your struct, it'll still have space associated with it, but there'll be no value there. There's nothing that's being set into it. Um, we grab out the underlying value type, which in this case will be uint 16t, we delegate back into the reader to read it, and then we can test to make sure that it's the value that we expect. If not, it's protocol error, we can blow up. Um, and Writing this out is pretty straightforward. You just get the compile time value that's baked into uh, the integral um, t, or integral constant t, and write it to the wire. So the more interesting part of all this is dealing with variable length types, strings, arrays of integral types, maps, whatever. Um, for the purposes of this talk, I'm gonna assume that we represent strings as a uint 16t length, and some variable number of chars that will be read immediately following the UN 16T. Um, the implementation of this is pretty unsurprising. You just add an overload for std string, read the length, construct a string for that many chars in the uh, buffer, advance the buffer by the length of the string. Writing is also the same thing. You write out the length, and then you write out the chars, you advance the buffer. But we can also extend this to cover things like vectors. Um, you have a length prefix and you're gonna read some number, some number of elements of type T. You don't care about T because we've already started to build up a structure for generically reading T's um, from the buffer. So read the length, for length, consume each T in order um, and then place them in the back of the vector that we're building up. Maps will work, oops, got a, Oh, magically better. <laughs> I am alighting that check here. <laughs> There's also other cases where you can, on the right side, if you pass in a vector bigger than is representable by that type, you should assert that as well. But, but in presentation land, I, I just skip those checks. <laughs> Um, so in the case of a map, it's pretty much the same thing. You write out the length of the map, you write out the key, you write out the value, or is this, oh, this is reading. So you read in the key, read in the value, and then place that key and value into your unordered map. Um, so at this point, you can pretty much do this kind of a structure. I've got a bit of fixed length stuff at the beginning a variable length structure of variable length header properties, um, a message type, and then some variable length content at the end. Um, doing this with fixed overlays gets to be pretty, pretty tedious, um, just, just to cover this much, in my experience anyway. Um, so I've totally glossed over the issue of framing here. In the case of UDP, you get a datagram, you get all the data at once, you can continue to ignore framing. But with TCP, that's generally not the case. 
Um, if you're lucky and you have a kind and gentle soul on the other end of the wire, they'll send you a, a fixed length header. They'll tell you how much data you're going to get back. And then you can read that fixed length header when you've got that many bytes, and you can read length, number of bytes, and then continue to process uh, from there. If you have framing that's essentially encoded in reading the types, um, I've worked on a couple of examples implemented using Boost ASIO's uh, stackless coroutines to do this. It's pretty onerous, but it can be made to work, but it's beyond the scope of what I want to talk about today. Um, so we're just going to assume that fixed header, header tells me everything I know to read the rest, the, the number of bytes to consume everything else I need in a given message. And to deal with framing in that way, we, we actually need to make a little bit of a change to the reader to make it a bit more useful. And specifically, we want to return both T and the consumed buffer. So I've consumed 32 bytes of header off, and I want to return buffer minus 32 bytes to be consumed by a subsequent call, something like this. So you'd read your fixed header. Um, you would read whatever the length number of bytes you got out of your fixed header were, and then you would call read to deserialize the remainder of the buffer you know, for however many types that you had in here. Obviously, at this point, you'd probably switch on message type and then make further decisions about how to decode the remainder of, of the message. So user-defined types, uh, one of the things we deal with in the financial world are prices, and people don't like their um, prices being rounded to the nearest power of two approximation of a, of a decimal. So they'll tend, a lot of exchanges will tend to define a specific representation that's precise for the prices that they want to exchange. Um, one example that I've come across is they use a uh, signed exponent and a 32-bit unsigned mantissa. So this is a case where the standard proposed uh, N to H, H to N, wouldn't work because you've got a signed 8-bit quantity and you would not be able to pass that to the proposed standard H2N and 2H generics. The reasoning there is, is that somewhere in a museum, somewhere there might be a ones complement machine that might want to still exchange data with you over the wire. Um, and so representing negative numbers becomes a problem if you just blindly cast them to the unsigned bit representation and back. But in practice, it's, people do it all the time and nobody gets bit by it. Um, in this case, to convert to the double approximation, it's just mantissa times pow 10 exponent. It's not particularly important to this example, but minus 2, 225 represents 2.25 in this case. And you would write that up something like this. Um, for user-defined types to use this technique, it's pretty important that they have cheap default constructors. Um, otherwise, this, this all falls apart. So this is obviously a pretty cheap default constructor. And you could go ahead and read it this way. You add an overload for decimal t, read it for the exponent, read it for the mantissa, and then just construct your decimal and assign it through. But we're going to come back to that in a minute because that's not the most general way of doing it because you're left basically writing those overloads for every single user-defined user data type that you want to be able to instantiate. Um, one of the things I deal with a lot are option products. Not particularly useful to this conversation, I guess, to delve into option theory and trading, but an option is typically comprised of the symbol for it. It'll be a, a contract listed on an exchange. Um, it will be an option over a given underlying. So in this case, this is a September $567.5 call, I believe, on Google. Um, the price is encoded there, and it expires on the 13th of September. Um, and a put or call, so indicating whether or not I have the right to buy at that price or the right to sell. Um, there are other fields and options as well. A lot of those are exchange defined, but this is sort of the meat of what you would use to represent one. And it would end up looking like this. So this is a variable length structure because it has two strings representing contract and underlying ID in it, but it's otherwise not terribly interesting. And I haven't really covered POSIX date um, reading, but that's, you know, you take whatever representation you have on the wire and figure out how to turn that into a date type that you can use in, in Boost. And um, 
Unfortunately, a lot of exchanges have very strange ways of wanting to specify that for you. Um, and they change them from time to time, but that's kind of beyond the scope of this talk. But another thing that we also deal with is once you have options, you may want to create a standardized contract which lets me buy and sell different combinations of them and then give that a name. And that's what a listed spread is. Um, it'll have an exchange uh, sign symbol ID and it'll have some variable length collection of contracts associated with it. So it looked like this, but unfortunately we can't actually read this. We know how to read the vector, we know how to read the contract ID, but what we don't really know how to do is read T when T itself is a fusion struct. Um, implementing that um, is pretty straightforward. We can test to see if it's a fusion sequence, and, at, and then this overload will get selected by the compiler, and then you can just, for each over val, you can now read T, we already know how to read vector, so we can read vector of T's, which are nested fusion structs. Um, the writer case, same exact thing, except it's gonna take a const reference to the field to write. The sequence is uh, from right? Yes, it's, a, it's part of, uh, I think, did I, yeah, that's is sequence, is a fusion trait. Um, You have to really, in the code, do this, but that, again, slideware, you know, all these long names don't really fit very well. Sorry. Um, having done that, we can go back and more generally deal with user-defined data types, because there's another macro that will take an existing type and then write all the boilerplate magic to make, make it into a fusion sequence, and that's this fusion adapt struct macro, and you have to list basically the fields that you want to adapt and their types. And then at this point, this is now a fusion sequence. You can go delete the specific overload for decimal T and our reader would just read it fine. Does the fusion sequence have a um, yes, yeah, it's, it's, this is statically compiled data. It's, so it's, there's nothing that is actually, when you instantiate a type that is a fusion struct, none of the fusion bits get instantiated with that. That is some static bit of information that's compiled and, it, and before each knows how to get at that static table. And then take a given instance and adapt it so they can pull out the fields. So there's no overhead over just what a plain old struct would be in terms of construction at that point. Um, obviously that cost will depend on how expensive your types are to construct inside of it, but if they're all cheap, um, then, then this works pretty well. So here we can fix up read to be a bit more generic because now we know how to read fusion sequences. We no longer have to specifically do the for each here. We can just call the reader directly. Um, and so it now generically reads any type T, whether it started out as a fusion sequence or not. Um, and then the writer has a similar change. So optional fields, another kind of variable length component to uh, uh, protocols that you might encounter. Typically these are indicated by some integral bit field where each bit indicates whether or not a given optional field is then present in the protocol. Uh, we might represent this as a type, call it field set. It says what is the underlying type the value on the wire, and I want to encode n bits in a standard bit set. Um, this is actually only a marker type as well. It won't store any data. And then I can model each optional field as a boost optional. Um, has people used boost optional? Okay. It's, it's an optionally empty value. Um, and there is an optional being considered for standardization and probably will end up in some capacity in C17. Um, the only thing that we really need to do beyond what optional already provides is encode the bit position um, that we need to reference later. Then you can define you know, type defs for your, your optional fields and what your field set consists of. In this case, we're going to encode 16 bits, so we have the 16 optional fields if we chose to use them. So you could go do something like this. We're going to basically have a marker saying, I encounter 16 bits here, which is a bit mask and tells me whether or not opt exercise and opt ticks are present or 
or not. So first thing that you need to do is we also use optional here to encode whether or not we saw the bit mask and to capture it um, because you're reading this stuff linearly. So you, you have to use fields in your reader to mark and capture data as you're reading through that you want to consume later, even though you don't necessarily care about it once you're done reading. You need to know which fields you actually care to read. And so that's all this does here is it reads the underlying type and constructs the bit mask or the, the bit set from the underlying type after it's read it. And then in the case of reading fields, if you haven't seen the field marker, it's a bad message, fail can't do anything. If you have, then you check each individual bit. If it's present, you read that type from the buffer and assign it into V or val. What am I, do I miss something here? Yeah, this I think is a copy and paste error. We don't actually need to do this. This is star this val. Um, so bad copy and paste here. So ignore this, ignore this, and put val there. Keynote's a very forgiving runtime environment. Um, the writer is a little more complicated, actually, because what we have to do here is not only capture um, the bit set, um, we have to capture the pointer back into the buffer where we're going to have to set those bits after we read, after we've looked at each optional field as to whether or not it was set. Um, so. That's what opt v is doing here, or will do here. We start out with it as null. Um, once we encounter the, the fields, we reset our bit set. We get a pointer um, to that point in the buffer where we're going to actually write the 16 bits of bit flags back into the stream when we're done, and then advance the buffer. <laughs> then for each field, um, if we haven't actually seen that marker, it's a bad message again. Otherwise, we, and this is actually also a bit of, this has an error, there should be an if statement wrapping this. If val, then set in, and you assign through the current state of the bit field to the location in the buffer, and then read val, actually. Am I doing this? This is this is the right case. Again, this is I was I was tweaking these earlier, and I apparently made a copy and paste error. Um, in the case of write, you want to check to see if this optional field is set. If it is, you set the bit position. You assign through the current state of the bit mask back into the the buffer, and you write the value back to the stream. So there should be an if val check around that. Um, yeah, it makes sense. I mean, you just have to break up the processing into two discrete steps at that point. You have to say, well, this is a collection of optional fields by this, and you have to have some other way of indicating that as like maybe another struct that contained all your optionals. Um, I don't think that this is any less efficient because once you've encountered that point in the stream, you're just assigning an int through a pointer, which is pretty efficient. Yeah, the reason I'm thinking about this fragmentation is are you saying are, if you're going to have the fragment, the, when you're writing and you need to fragment the loop because you're within the length of the frame, mm -hmm. you might need to send out the, uh, send out your bit field before Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a consideration. If that's the case, then you would have to capture both frames, potentially, in your writer. Oh, okay. So you write to your header frame, and then you, you process your body frame. Um, would be one sort of quick way of doing that. Um, the one with the missing if. Uh -huh. um, okay, 
uh, it's an optional, so that's what the star val is basically dereferencing and getting right. the value of the optional. Right. Right. It never gets written out. Oh, actually, that's not true. I mean, it gets written out every single time here, basically. So you're saying ops to you long, and then you cast it to the underlying type that you want to write, and you're just assigning that to the pointer or the Z reference pointer. So we write it, essentially write it over and over again. Right. And so the assumption here is that this is a pretty cheap call, which I'm pretty sure it is. Um, I haven't actually looked at bit sets implementation, but I can't imagine that being particularly grim. And then write, right, and then write, yeah, you'd write ops in one go at the end if you had an end marker. I just chose not to put an end marker. Um, but yeah. So it can be the case that we don't really care necessarily about everything that we're getting, or we don't care about it necessarily right now. We might want to apply some filter criteria before spending time actually deserializing it. Strings, maps are actually particularly horrible because they do a lot of allocation. Um, vectors also do allocation. So particularly in my, my business, this is something we, we, we look for ways to avoid. Um, we'll start with strings. Uh, Boost has a type called string ref. It was written by Marshall Clow. So if you see him, thank him for it. It's a wonderful piece of software. It's a non-owning type. It has an interface like std string. Um, Jeffrey Askin put together a proposal called String View, which is likely also to be in C++17. Um, there are a number of use cases for this, particularly where you receive a string and you want to do some processing on it and pass it on to other calls that might consume a string. You don't want to be making allocations and copies all the way down the call chain. Um, in our case, we're going to basically just use it to mark, I saw a string here um, in the underlying buffer, but I'm not actually going to copy it out. I'm just going to record its location and its length and then give it a standard string-like interface. So starting from our string implementation, making this a string ref becomes pretty much the same thing. You read the length, and then you construct the string ref by getting a const char star from the buff, giving it a length, and then advancing your buffer to consume that string. Um, to do arbitrary lazy types, this actually gets to be a little more complicated depending on how elaborate you want to get. But the main thing we need to be able to do is cheaply determine how long some type is. So if we can skip through and figure out how long it is without spending a lot of time otherwise reading it and otherwise, you know, just doing buffer arithmetic, then, then this, this works pretty well. And then if we can do that, we can encode where we started in the buffer, where we finished, and then later call back into read to get that type on demand. Um, so you might declare a type that looks like this. It doesn't really fit very well on the slide. I'll have to apologize um, for that. But you need, this is a type that would, you know, it would accumulate size. So it's very much like the reader case. You just get rid of most of the reads. The only read that we'd really need to preserve is the ability to read integral constants because we need to be able to read the length fields and accumulate them. And then for every type, you just accumulate size and advance the buffer. In fact, in the sample code, I even went so far as to get rid of size and just do it from the resulting buffer versus the buffer I started from. Um, that would be done inside this get size free function here. Um, so given that, we can construct a lazy type that just receives a buffer, um, constructs that buffer for whatever size type T would be encountered in that buffer on the wire. And then later, to get it back out, at that point, we can take our buffer there and delegate to read, to read that type T. And we need to be able to get its buffer size because we want to be able to read these lazy types um, when they're encountered in a, in a stream. So we basically, lazy T does a bit of buffer, a sizing and a bit of buffer arithmetic, and assigns that into val, and then just advances buff by the size that would be read had it went ahead and aggressively read the data at that point. Um, so it skips the buffer over it. Yes? Um, 
having a line by inside or to the T itself? You're assuming that the T's are either can be decomposed into integral types and that those are represented, you know, in one byte, two bytes, four bytes, eight bytes on the wire. So for every type T, you assume that so you don't have to worry about, I'm going to read an arbitrary struct off the wire as a T that's not being visited as if it was a fusion struct. But if you had an arbitrary struct that you wanted to read, say it was specified in the protocol and it made no sense to, to adapt it, you would have to declare that packed. And then this would still work. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this assumes that actually in, okay. in the default case. Um, but if, if that weren't the case, you would have to deal with pack structs um, because otherwise you get the padding of the machine and that's clearly not going to be portable across the wire. Um, so, so yeah, lazy T must be a fusion struct in, in, in this example. It must be something the reader already knows how to consume correctly. So you can't just put any T. Um, I don't know if I could get a concept to constrain that. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe I get you to write it for me. <laughs> um, so at this point, we actually can read this. Um, we have a variable length struct of variable length types. And at this point, I would submit that this would pretty much read any anything fitting that general pattern. Um, and you can get it lazily. So we can filter on contract ID, don't care about this contract, just keep going. If we do, the point we do, we can materialize a vector and process the legs at that point that we care about. Um, not in this talk, but in a sample code, there's an implementation of a lazy range, which takes this one step further and just gets rid of the vector. Um, you get a begin end, and when you iterate it, it will materialize the individual types out of the stream at that point. So, um, and I'll post links to the sample code at the end of the talk. So, another thing that you might want to be able to do once you've gone to all the trouble of marking up your types as fusion structures is be able to pretty print them. You know, say some node hipsters took over your back office and they want you to send all the compliance reports in JSON. Um, it'd be nice to be able to do that without having to write a bunch of extra code, again, on top of what you've already done to get it from the exchange in the first place. And I'd like to be able to do it like this, you know, stream it somewhere um, easily. In order to do that, I need to create a type that holds my message, a reference to it, and defines a streaming operator that knows how to visit the, uh, the contents of the fusion struct. And unfortunately, we can't use the fusion for each technique to do this because of the way fusion lets you get at the field names. You have to ask them by a compile time known index. And so that's what this range C business up here is doing, is it's basically saying, give me the size of T as an MPL list and generate the integer values from zero to that as this type def. And the thing to remember here is that Fusion is a compile time bit of machinery. And the only bridge in Fusion, or not Fusion, sorry, MPL is a compile time bit of machinery. The only bridge from MPL to runtime is this for each call. And so it takes a compile time known sequence and will invoke a visitor type for that sequence for each element in it. Um, so what will end up happening is this is going to call our visitor with 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 for each field that's there. It's pretty mundane, but um, unfortunately this is the only way to actually make the rest of it work. Um, you can then create some writer that knows how to format things as JSON, you know, captures your O stream that you want to write into and passes that on to the writer as well as your message type. Do I not? I did not pass my message to my constructor here. This is unfortunate. The sample code actually has it right. Um, but copying and pasting back and forth, it seemed to have missed it. Um, and then the visitor is by ordinal index here. It's not by type. Um, 
in the fusion struct, it's by the MPL ordinal index of 0, 1, 2, 3 for each member that was in the fusion struct. And what that allows you to do is call this fusion extension struct member name, whatever the type is of the field, or the message type, the fusion type, um, the value of n, which is the, the compile time known index of that field, call, and that'll give you back a char star, const char star with the field name as you compiled it into the code. And I'm just presuming that writer is going to be able to write, you know, quote, field name, colon, as you would in JSON. And then you do the same um, thing to get the fusion type here. So that'll return a type T. And then the assumption is, is that our writer type knows how to format each of the individual types that we can read out of our fusion struct as JSON. And then interleaves commas if we need to. Um, I know that's pretty murky, so questions as to what, how that actually works? Or is it clear as mud? Then you'll have to figure out some way of translating from you know what your field names are you know in your compiled source to what you actually want to pretty print them as. So you could you could do a map to translate those. But this will give you like literally the compiled in string um, that you specify. Not in practice, because the, the, we tend to have situations where they're collections of things, right? And so there's a few, there's a few fields and then a couple of collections to do everything else. Obviously, you had 30, 40, 50 members in a class, you'd start to run into the fusion limits because these aren't very addicts, unfortunately. Although I think as of 156, at least the MPL side of it has added very addict list support. So that can be an arbitrary length, but I don't know if Fusion has accommodated that change. I haven't, for the protocols I've written to date, I have not run into those limits. Although one of the problems with using Fusion in MPL is because it does machine-generated expansions for a list of zero, a list of one, a list of two, a list of three, all of those template expansions get to be pretty onerous from a compile time standpoint. So the sooner that boost gets everything to very addicts, I think the better off we'll be because this can inflate your compile times. It's not horrible, but there are other techniques that are much worse for that. Um, so that's basically what I have. Um, questions? Yeah, that's how you do it. You just pass, take it by reference on your read or write call and just pass it through to the, the reader or writer type underneath. They're temporaries, right? So there's no need to make that copy or anything. And that's, that's how we've typically done it. And we, it is pretty typical that we actually have that in, in real code. Um, I just kind of skipped it here because it begins to obfuscate what is already somewhat obfuscated. Um, Stephanus. A bit. I haven't thought about that. I mean, they, they usually stop at, I mean, even the hardware case, the embedded case I've dealt with, you're actually, in that case, we're actually laying things out as they would be sent to an exchange on the other end because we're basically writing them into the memory of a, of a very specialized component that knows how to stomp on a send line on TCP as quickly as possible. Um, so they tend to be pretty standard layout. I never had to really deal with the case where and, and bit banging fields like on a serial line or whatever. If I understand your question, yeah, I, I imagine most of it would still apply it's just the buffer reading, right? Would definitely get messier, and I think one of the problems you start running into there is, is that you know ASIO obviously wants to move by bytes, so you have to figure oh, yes. out.
Vector bool? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think what you probably want to do is take the, uh, the mutable buffer or const buffer, and you basically derive from it. That's why it provides you a bit of a time time. Yes. Um, also, come by time. Huh? So, come by time. How are they? Um, are they for the code that we have, they're not too bad. Um, it's kind of hard to compare that, like the sample code on my Mac that does just this part of the protocol and a few other additional bits. It takes a couple of seconds. Um, the problem is, is that depending on where we end up using this in practice, I have other pathologically bad compile times for reasons completely unrelated to this technique. So it's hard to say how much of those compile times are due to this at that point. Um, but I haven't found this to be particularly onerous from a compile time standpoint uh, to use. It, extensive use of the MPL outside this has led to some pretty ballooned compile times. Um, and it's, it's in those cases where I also have some of this going on, so it's kind of hard to separate who's doing what, because <laughs> um, the compilers also don't give me great instrumentation either. Um, from a runtime standpoint, uh, Fusion will unroll loops um, automatically. And while I haven't looked at the assembly output, I'm gonna speculate that most compilers will be able to unroll, unroll the loops even further because the length of the sequence is known statically at compile time. So it should be able to sort of within limits, you know, not blowing out your micro cache or whatever, unroll um, these loops even further. So it shouldn't be, for all intents and purposes, any different than if you had to go and visit every single member of, of a type that you were, you were uh, doing the overlay technique uh, with pack structs and fixing up byte ordering. And in fact, with overlays, if you are on a machine that doesn't support um, packed access efficiently, you have to copy it out into some unpacked type anyway before you can really do anything with the fields. So. Um, so I think in, if that were the case, this should be pretty much performance competitive. I will say that we, we use these in exchange uh, market data feed handlers, and they do not this technique does not impose any significant performance penalty on reading market data. Um, we're definitely in the nanosecond, hundreds of nanoseconds range to process a tick using this technique. Ah, um, I have an example of ignore, like never read it, never write it. All you do is you encode the type. You know its size, right? You can compute its size, you just advance the buffer when you encounter that type to just completely skip over it. And in the write case, you just there's nothing to write. You're just skipping that many bytes and leaving that hole in the, uh, in the, in the buffer. Um, part of the problem in the sample code, like lazy here, doesn't handle the case where I'm sending and receiving the same kind of structure that happens to have a lazy in it. It's almost always the case that you want lazy on the read side, not the write side. And so I have a much more complicated implementation of lazy so I can support round tripping to make sure all the code works. And um, so there, there are some complications in the sample code that you wouldn't actually have in practice um, because typically on on lazy or completely ignored fields, you're just going to skip them in a simple buffer arithmetic at that point. Yes? Have you got anything special with versioning for this kind of setup? Like, you know, you have to code in the wild or the exchange to have something to support a couple things? Yeah. Um, nothing particularly elaborate. Uh, a lot of times they'll add fields we don't care about, so we'll just mark them ignore. Um, it's very often that they add fields for specific use cases for instruments we don't trade or are not going to trade now. And so that's where your never read this example comes in. You add another like version to the version list that you check before you blow up and you just ignore the fields you don't care about. It would get trickier if you had to sort of optionally read them between versions. And I think in that case, you'd have to go back into the types and start adding some sort of version marker and basically saying, uh, and oh, by the way, this only, this, this only works for this protocol version. And you could encode that integral constant as part of that type and then check that each time to see. You'd have to stash away the version once you saw it in your reader and then determine whether or not to read that field 
um, but outside the scope of this talk. All right, that's it. That's all I got.